Okay, so maybe we'll get started. It's uh, 601. So on behalf of the AHPBA and the ASTS, we'd like to welcome you tonight to our uh, webinar um, in our ongoing series of webinars. We're extremely excited to have a collaborative webinar tonight with our partners from the ASTS uh, on controversies in transplant oncology. My name is Tim Pollack and I am the president of the AHPBA and I'm extremely excited uh, to have with us tonight an amazing group of experts who are going to be discussing um, a number of different uh, controversial uh, topics. I'm looking forward to learning a lot from um, all of our expert discussions. And we also would encourage all of you as participants um, to use the chat room liberally. Uh, we will try to uh, be following along with that and answer um, via chat. Um, and then also um, address some of these uh, comments, uh, perhaps uh, live as we can get to them. So uh, again, uh, welcome. At this point, I'd like to um, hand things over to uh, Dr. Marwan Abuljad, who is the president of the ASTS and uh, welcome him uh, to uh, make a few comments. Marwan. Uh, thank you, Tim. I'm very excited to participate in this joint webinar. Uh, with our joint societies. Uh, certainly the field of hepatobiliary surgery and liver transplantation is evolving and there's a lot of crossroads that together we'll be interfacing. So I appreciate the opportunity to having a joint webinar together and have our battles cross over. Uh, the main theme for tonight is going to be focusing on transplant oncology and particularly difficult situations, which are situations we both face in our particular fields. And I'm looking forward for future more collaborations of this nature. I would love to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Roberto Hernandez Alejandro. Uh, Dr. Alejandro is a lead the transplant infertility surgeon at the University of Rochester and will be presenting to us tonight uh, on the spotlight presentation for liver transplant for colorectal liver metastasis in the United States. Is it reality? Well, Roberto, take it away. All right, um, thank you very much. I will start sharing my, my screen. Uh, can you see my screen now? Great. Right. right? Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure. I'm a dual member of, of both of those societies and it's great to see uh, this collaboration be between both societies and especially with these controversial uh, topics where I think hepatobiliary and transplantations comes together. So I was asked uh, to present on liver transplantation for colorectal metastases, the specific here in the United States. And the question is, is this a, a reality if this is happening here or not? Um, I have nothing to disclose regarding this uh, presentation. Um, and first of all, I think a majority of the people knows about the data that is coming from uh, Norway. Um, and the question is, is this justifiable? Um, so we can see clearly that in selected patients, uh, the overall survival that is able to obtain with liver transplantation for unresectable colorectal metastasis in selected patients is impressive and very interesting. It's even better than some of the patients that we do liver resection and disease-free survival pretty acceptable. And of course, it depends on what criteria we use, the Oslo score in the left side, and we can also look for FONG score, which is very strict if it's zero to two, or from three to four, it will be a worst outcome. So there are different uh, uh, criteria that we can use. And if we follow these criteria and we're strict, the outcomes could be pretty, pretty impressive. Selection criteria that has been used here, I mentioned Oslo score. We can see it in the left side, the clinical risk score who has been probably 22 years out there, is in the right side. And uh, clearly this is uh, what is able to give us uh, very, very good outcomes. Very few patients will fulfill this criteria. There's another criteria, which is the TTB, which is the, uh, the total tumor volume, uh, looking at PET scan when it's less than 70 uh, uh, milli cubic millimeters in the PET scan. Those are the patients who are gonna be able to have better outcome reaching up to 80% survival at five years and perhaps around 25% of being cured. What would be the impact if we open this in the United States? This is a slide that we published a paper uh, not so long ago, looking at the 
number and percentage of colorectal patients. So it's a very small proportion of patients who will drop from colorectal cancer all the way to the strict criteria of uh, liver transplantation. And the impact that this will have in the number of liver transplant in the US will be between one to 2%. So it's not a huge amount what it will be taking from this. I was asked to sp specific talk about United States, what's happening? When we review the data on UNOS from December of 2017 to August, 2020, there has been 22 cases of liver transplant for colorectal metastasis in this modern or new era of this hot topic. Of those 12 institutions, there has been, I was a reviewer and then in the American Transplant Congress that is coming in 2021, there's three abstracts coming with that, uh, a majority of them for oral presentations and more institutions are getting in interested. Of those 22 cases, majority has been done with live donation, two with DCDs and the rest one with what I think is probably extended criteria organs from brain, uh, brain dead donors. I will personally classify two types of liver transplants in the US. One is oncological outcome that perhaps that's the question that people would like to know more, which are based on the Oslo score, the clinical risk score or the M uh, MTB score that I mentioned. And some of them are the liver failure patients who have had uh, liver metastases. They got a lot of toxicity from the chemotherapy uh, and then they have liver failure or a lot of patients who have ablations with liver failure. And we have seen a more higher number now of patients who are coming possible for uh, liver transplantation after hepatic artery, uh, hepatic artery pump, biliary failure and damage in the liver without evidence of oncological disease. When we look at the regions uh, where, where, uh, which has been doing liver transplantation, you can see that in all the regions in green, there has been activity. And to my knowledge, after August, this was until September, in region six, there has been one case that it is my knowledge that it had took place not so long ago. So I look at the MEL score, average MEL score of those 22 patients for colorectal metastasis, and the MEL score is 14. And if we look at after the allocation system of the changes in the acuity circles, and we look at the different DSA, clearly majority of DSAs are way above of, of a minimum mouse score of 14. Perhaps some little pockets in some areas would be have access to cadaveric organ donation for, for these patients uh, or brain dead donors. Looking at those organs who are discarded, for example, DCDs, around 27% of the DCDs in the States are discarded. Last year was 301. Uh, specific on brain dead donors, around 7% of the organs are discarded, uh, more than 500, and probably that would be a source of organs, but of course depends on the quality of these discarded. So we wanted to go more granular. Majority of the ones who have been discarded, some of them are from macrosteatosis, more than 30%, uh, around 150. And those ones who are for elderly age, it was difficult to look at those ones who are above 70 or 75, but around 100 were for age about 65. So clearly this is showing us that there is a pool of organs that perhaps could be used, but um, it's a little bit difficult to decide if these could be good organs or not. What about the, the, the option of life donation? Of course, you require to have an experienced uh, surgeon uh, majority of them they, with the combination of having a parabillary surgery. We need to remember the double equipoise. We need to be able to uh, put the risk of a live donor when there is a good selected uh, donor, it's in a low risk uh, of surgery, when we can get a very good outcome in the recipient. That's why we have to be very clear in and strict in the criteria, experience centers, it's a new era where transplant are learning a lot from medical oncology and vice versa. So it's a new area of, uh, of uh, transplant oncology, the hepatology support, administration, and uh, definitely these are areas where we have to document in trials. This is a recent paper that was that is impressed in the activity in the United States where our center participated. And we can clearly see the activity of living donor liver transplantation in the US is increasing significantly and will reach what the peak of 2002. And I can clearly show, we'll see that in 2021 will be uh, uh, ahead of these. This has a 
relatively a small uh, impact in the waiting list, but it helps some patients on the waiting list uh, on getting access to transplantation. And this paper that was just recently accepted, I think yesterday in liver transplantation, clearly showing that those centers could do between 16 to 25 live donors every two years uh, are the ones who are gonna have a, a much better outcome, clearly showing uh, a benefit on the activity on those centers who um, are, there's a, there's a learning curve. And the activity has been increasing in, 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 in from 2010 to 2019. The number of regions doing more live donors is clearly growing. And I think there's a lot of attention in this area. I wanna share uh, the University of Rochester experience. We started around August of 2019. We have done only five cases, perhaps small, but we have been strict out of 24 cases that we have been assessed. All of them has been with live donors. We don't have too much access to um, um, discarded organs and those who are discarded sometimes, we use it in a lot of our patients who are on the waiting list. Many of those patients who were not candidates, they progressed when they were in our list. There's five patients in the pipeline. All the patients are currently alive. One patient has recurrence on, on, and it's under chemo. We have uh, a hybrid model of HPV and liver transplant surgeons. We have a high volume of liver resections where we were not doing in Rochester and we're doing around 70 to 80 uh, access uh, per year with a, a growing volume of liver transplantation per year. And our living donor liver transplant activity in cirrhotic patients with medium and low male score is helping us to offer this to patients. Uh, in my area, the medium male score, it's around 33. Uh, so therefore it's difficult to get access for patients with lower male score. And sharing this case of a patient 39 years old, BMI 29, have a, a, a adenocarcinoma of the sigmoid colon with bilateral liver metastasis, high CEA, and the patient has no mutations. The patient received chemotherapy around 12 cycles, um, the par partial response from liver and primary, Patients receive Y90, the CEA drops to 12, patients have radio frequency ablation, and that is the way that this patient was treated. Um, they removed the primary robotic eight weeks before, uh, and the patient stayed no, eight weeks with no chemo. Before the, the colon resection and after the colon resection, after seeing our transplant program. After that, the patient received a full theory for another three months, and this is a, scan, um, I hope you can see this and I have to do this because otherwise it won't work. This is post chemo. The patient responded, he has several liver metastases in the periphery and some in the center in the hepatic veins closed. And the patient responded very well. There was some portal hypertension um, in, in this patient after receiving chemotherapy. And we, our option was living donor liver transplantation. Uh, the donor uh, donated the right side of the liver. Those livers turns to be sometimes very affected from chemotherapy and very um, affected from ablation and radiation. Um, this was the reconstruction in the back table and the perfusion of that liver looks pretty good. And importantly to show this is, this patient still have cancer, some of them. And this is, you can see all of these, if you see my mouse, that's cancer than the rest of the liver parenchyma. And the patient has significant response, but not completely pathological response. The follow-up of this patient, um, no complications, fortunately, no evidence of bio-leak. The follow-up has been almost one and a half years with no evidence of recurrence. Our immunosuppression is based initially with TAC and we switch the patient to serolimus conversion around three months if there is no surgical complications. The patient, we don't maintain on chemotherapy and she was able to see her son graduated from high school. That was one of her big goals. Is this patient gonna do well and is gonna have a, a recurrence or not? I don't know, but I think it will be very difficult to reach this outcome just with chemotherapy in this patient. So just to conclude my takeaway points here, definitely it's a reality. It's here in the US and it's here to stay. It's not gonna go away. I think it should be done at centers with that, the multidisciplinary expertise of cancer, um, and liver transplantation together. There's a lot of interest in transplant oncology. The selection of patients is critical and we need to be strict and we really need to be documented this. We're working with other institutions, with Cleveland, for example, 
de developing a national registry and hopefully more uh, centers could be joining this. Um, and I think it's up to each center if they want to use living donation, DCD, or discarded braided donors according to their logistics. And um, happy to answer questions. Hey, Roberta, this is Tim. That was a fantastic talk. So I, I think we have a couple minutes for questions. I'll read a couple off to you. Um, do you know if all of these transplant were, uh, were done on protocol, um, uh, on purpose, or were, were there any kind of like, um, you know, incidental findings on the explant or things like that? Were these all done on protocol? These, you know? all, all these patients were done in protocol in our okay. institution. But the ones that you mentioned nationally in the United States, you know, were those all done on protocol? Um, I, I think so, uh, Tim. It uh, seems that all of them has been done in, on protocol. There was, uh, but there are some that were done for liver failure with high male score uh, that they're supposed not to have cancer, some of these patients. That, that was another question, so thank you. And then someone's asking about the insurance coverage. Could you just speak briefly on that? I think the more we do, and hopefully having good outcomes, and as soon as as soon as we publish, we will have less problem. We have one of our hepatologists in our team that he's like a lawyer and he's very good with insurance. If I wouldn't have him, I, I think I will be able to do one, but all of them has been a lot of fights with insurance, but we have been successful. Right now we're working with a patient outside of the state that is very difficult to get it. Uh, the patient need a liver transplant will be the best, but it's getting very difficult to convince insurance. So. Um, hopefully, and we sent the data from uh, Norway, but they said this is not US data. So we need to publish uh, data from here. And then the last question is, um, what about um, adjuvant therapy? Is there any um, multidisciplinary discussions based on the explant and what's found in the explant, whether these patients should get any adjuvant therapy? Uh, so to my understanding, there's a European uh, play. I think it's, a, I don't know if it's France or Italy that they are giving chemotherapy after in, in their protocol. To my understanding in North America, who's doing this, including Toronto, they're not using chemotherapy in these patients. So did he freeze? I think he froze. He's gonna leave us hanging. And the recurrence rate, very interesting, which I didn't show. 3% in the liver, according to the data from Norway, uh, compared to liver resection. So not sure why is this, but uh, there's interesting uh, research to do, to do there. Okay, and so uh, one, one last question, because uh, uh, Dr. Geller, we can't, we have to let Dr. Geller ask this question. He just wanted to ask if you could comment on the conundrum of using cadaveric versus a living donor for this indication. Um, so, well, I, it, if I would have access to uh, cadaveric organ donation, that would be great. Uh, difficult for me to have access for in, my, in the place that I am with a cadaveric donation. And I think there are probably some areas where they can have access to cadaveric donation. Um, uh, but I think you, I will be cautious because if, I know that a center used to get a DCD and the patient developed like a severe ischemic angiopathy at three months and the patient now need a retransplant. So, um, I think I, if we're developing something new, uh, hopefully we can guarantee that we're giving a good graft and the failure is not because of the uh, cancer. And I, um, I, I think we, we have to be cautious. Roberto, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you very, very much. So our, our next um, set of speakers are uh, Dr. Uh, Hawksworth, who will be presenting um, a case on living uh, donor liver transplant for metastatic neuroendocrine tumor and our feature panelist is Dr. Kim Oltoff from University of Pennsylvania. Jason? I don't know, are you muted, Jason? We can't hear you yet. I can see your slide. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Thanks for this opportunity, I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to Dr. Oltoff for agreeing to moderate this session. This is a case um, presentation and Dr. Oltoff will moderate and then I'll open it up at the end for any other comments or questions. So getting into the case, this is a 62 year old female with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor and unresectable bilobar liver metastases. She had a liver biopsy at the time of her presentation, which showed a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. It was well differentiated with 
low mitotic rate. She was otherwise healthy with real no past medical or past surgical history. And you can see her labs here. Um, she did have a cholestasis, which I'll talk about in a second, but otherwise her liver and uh, other labs were within normal limits. So she was initially treated, evaluated and treated at an outside hospital where she underwent several taste procedures for her metastatic neuroendocrine um, disease to her liver. And unfortunately, this resulted in multiple biliary strictures with recurrent cholangitis. And ultimately, she was treated with chronic uh, PTCs and uh, had multiple admissions for cholangitis with antibiotics. So she was referred from the outside hospital for liver transplantation. We don't have her original films, but this was her dotatate scan on presentation. And you can see she has multiple bilobar liver metastases. Her primary was still in place, which was a pancreatic tail uh, primary. And you can see also her PTC catheters in the right lobe of her liver. So there was also a question on her dotatate scan of mediastinal nodes, which we evaluated with a transbronchial biopsy, which was negative. And then we resected her primary first with a robotic distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy. And this was about two years ago. She did well with that. And we were able to get a little bit a better assessment of her um, biology. So her primary was a three centimeter uh, pancreatic tumor, well differentiated, low mitotic rate, low KI67 percentage. She did have a positive lymphovascular invasion, positive perineural invasion, and one out of eight lymph nodes was positive. Her margins were negative. And this was felt to be concordant with her original liver metastases biopsy by our pathologist. So we waited six months, repeated her dotatate scan, and essentially she had unchanged liver metastases. She did have some what looked like positive portal lymph nodes on the dotatate scan. So kind of putting all of this together, this was a 62-year-old otherwise healthy female with unresectable pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor liver metastases, seemed to be an indolent, slow-growing tumor, but was invasive, and unfortunately developed severe biliary complications from her taste therapy. Um, her dotatate scan did show portal lymph, and, uh, lymph nodes that appeared to be involved with uh, neuroendocrine tumor, and her primary was resected at this time. So turning this over to Dr. Oltoff, do you feel like this patient is a potential transplant candidate and would benefit from liver transplantation? Uh, thanks, Jason. I think when you get a referral for a, a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor, you have to think about it um, not as can we cure this patient, but I think some often it's more of can is it a it's palliative and how much can you improve and and improve their survival? Because particularly if you you look at this candidate that might have portal lymph nodes and things like that, you know, the, the chance of it coming back is, is relatively high. Saying that this, you know, you were able to resect the primary, so you do have some of the basic pathology, looking at the aggressiveness of it, and, and this, even if it does come back, it might um, uh, be a very slow uh, process. When we've been referred patients like this, it's been two two primary categories. One would be um, just be, to get rid of the tumor. And, and those are the difficult ones because it'll probably come back. Or if you're doing it for quality of life and you're trying to improve the patient or improve the patient's survival. And I think this woman with biliary strictures and PTCs, uh, we've had patients that have been sent to us because they've had basically liver failure because they've been, all these tumors have been taste so often. I certainly think that's an indication for transplant. I think you have to think a little bit longer if you're just trying to say, hey, can we cure you of your disease because you're not, and it's a non-symptomatic uh, neuroendocrine tumor because I'm not sure if you're going to make their life or their quality of life any better. So yes, I think for this patient, we would definitely consider her for transplantation. The concern is how do you get a liver for them? I don't, you know, if 
your melts go or go up, you might be able to get a deceased donor. But I think oftentimes you're you're uh, you're stuck with the potential of having to look for a living donor. Um, and the important thing for living donors, you have to be pretty transparent with whoever the donor is about the likelihood of recurrent disease. That, that was our exact discussion. And, and essentially, um, just like everything you said, you know, she had a poor quality of life, mostly related to her biliary complications. So we appealed her case to the UNOS National Liver Review Board and she was awarded 25 mild exception points. Um, and it's, this isn't well known because it's, it's a rare problem, but there are specific UNOS criteria for being awarded uh, MELD exception points for neuroendocrine tumor, and these are listed here. And this basically fits the bill of, of our patient, um, a patient who is, is 60 years old, primary malignancy with, um, without extrahepatic disease, and unresectable disease. The tumors have to meet radiographic criteria. They should be well differentiated, um, ideally and low grade. Um, and, and actually the tumor metastatic replacement should not exceed 50% of the total liver volume. So they shouldn't have a liver completely replaced with neuroendocrine tumor and then a neg negative metastatic workup. So our patient essentially fit this bill. However, as you know, in our region, a MELD of 25 isn't gonna get you a good quality or, or many offers at all for um, particularly for an ABOO so her daughter ultimately ended up stepping forward as a living donor. She was young, 26 years old, healthy, um, it's a thin, normal workup, including liver function, and anatomically appeared to be a good right lobe living donor. Her right lobe liver volume was 780 cc's with a total liver volume of 1,340 cc's. So this gave us a graft weight to re uh, recipient weight ratio of 1.2% and left the donor with a, a future liver remnant of 43%. And there was an anatomic variant of her middle hepatic vein, which I'll show in a second. And also in her workup, we did a cross match, which was very highly positive for T and B cell with multiple DSAs. So I'll just show her donor anatomy quickly because we'll comment on that. Um, you can see her portal vein, the donor's portal vein anatomy is normal and of importance, the middle hepatic vein had a four millimeter segment H branch and then essentially the entire middle hepatic vein drained segment five. She had a nice right uh, hepatic vein, small right inferior hepatic vein branches that were insignificant and not shown here, but her hepatic artery anatomy was conventional. So a little bit of nuance with her donor, um, donor uh, vascular anatomy that is important in these cases. So a couple questions come up with all of this for Dr. Oltoff. And one is, is this a, an appropriate case for a living donor, um, both ethically and, and from a feasibility standpoint? How would you reconstruct this hepatic vein outflow? And then at your center, does would a positive cross match like this matter? Um, so I think there's a couple things to think about. One, like I said, you have to be very transparent with the donor about the potential for recurrent disease and how it could improve the patient's life afterwards and, and then weigh that risk and benefit. I think a young, healthy woman with a with a good percentage, uh, you know, remnant liver volume, the, in an experienced center, the risk is, is relatively low, but she does have to know that the, there might be recurrent disease. I think uh, of note in this recipient as well, and you mentioned it, and there's some questions coming up on the, the chat as well, is, is how do you assess that potential positive lymph node? Um, do you like when we're doing transplants for um, cholangiocarcinoma, do you do a, a preoperative laparoscopic lymph, lymph adenectomy to see if it's a positive lymph node and will that matter? Um, I'm not so sure if it matters if you're taking uh, the node out, it's, you're already transplanting for metastatic disease. Um, and I'd be interested to hear what, what some of the other people think, but I, I think this is an appropriate uh, case for living donation. You have a good lobe, um, you have a relatively healthy uh, um, 
recipient as well, you should have excellent, you know, technical and clinical um, outcomes. Um, as far as the hepatic vein outflow that we routinely reconstruct um, those large branches, anything over five millimeters or so, and we use um, our cadaveric uh, vein grafts that we have stored in the fridge from previous living, do from previous deceased donors uh, from a week or two beforehand. So we believe that the better the outflow, the better the graft function. And you also had good volume uh, for the right lobe. Um, your third question about the positive cross match, I'll have to say we never do cross matches. So, and we haven't seemed to have any big issues with that. So that's not something we routinely do. And even, uh, for example, like if we're doing a liver kidney and the kidney has a positive cross match, we'll stu still do a liver kidney with the sense of it being protected by the liver. So that has not been um, something that has uh, made a, you know, that's a big big deal in our center anyway. Um, so those are my, uh, my answers to those questions. I'm trying to look at the, uh, um, some of the, the chat questions as well, as far as whether there have been, if the patient was on uh, systemic uh, therapy prior to liver transplant is one question for you as well. Right, so let me answer these questions from at least as far as what we did, and then I can talk about the, um, systemic therapy. So the donor obviously was counseled on the high risk of recurrence of disease, which is as high as um, 60%. And, and obviously in this case with the positive lymph nodes, she's gonna recur at some point. Um, and it's her daughter, so she understood all of that. Like you said, we use pedagogic iliac vein graft to reconstruct the middle of the pedic vein. Um, and, and again, as you emphasize, outflow is, is really important for these living donor grafts. And actually, we, we desensitized this patient um, with plasmapheresis, IVIG, and rituxan to get a negative cross match. We don't do this for cadaveric organs, but we felt in a living donor transplant that this might matter if she gets a bad rejection early. Um, and she did well with that. And there's some data to support that coming out of Korea. Um, as far as systemic therapy, she, she was treated with octreotide in the past. Again, most of her initial treatment was at an outside hospital. Um, and our understanding is that she didn't tolerate the octreotide therapy for a, a prolonged time. Um, fortunately, these, these uh, both donor and recipient patients did well. Her final pathology, again, was the well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. Interestingly, her hepatic vein margin was focally positive. So this was an R1 resection. We did sample the portal lymph nodes and three of those were positive as well, consistent with the good at eight scan. So obviously this patient will recur at some point. Um, she's, she's almost a year out and her, we're following her with good at eight scans. She still has some positive lymph nodes. There's no recurrence in the liver and she's otherwise doing well. And one thing that came up with this patient is the use of Everolimus for immunosuppression. She was in, initially treated with Tacrolimus. And there's data in, in the non-transplant setting that shows that Everolimus is a good um, potential treatment for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. So she's being transitioned to Everolimus. And I think at this point, I'll just open it up to the rest of the panel for any comments um, or further discussion on this case. Jason, thank you. This is a terrific presentation. A couple of questions, and maybe my first question, then we can pass it on to the rest of the group. Uh, first question is, did you consider multivisceral transplantation and match with that, if not considering lymphadenectomy and a little bit more radical on the hepatectomy? So we, we didn't consider her for multivisceral transplantation. I think, you know, we respected her primary. She still had positive lymph nodes, but the, the, the potential morbidity and higher mortality, um, certainly of a multivisceral transplant and poor, poorer long-term outcomes, I think, um, you know, kept us in, in the liver, just a liver, isolated liver transplant um, sort of treatment. And as far as the lymph nodes, I, I just don't know if it would matter if we did a very aggressive um, lymphadenectomy in a, in a patient like this, it's really just, sort of prognostic. I don't think that you would change her risk of recurrence if you did a very aggressive um, lymphadenectomy. 
I, I just think it's useful information to have as far as for post-operative monitoring yeah. and potential future therapies. Sure. And to add to that, I think, you know, she had the nodes. I think more taking more nodes out is not going to increase the chance of cure. I don't think this is a cure. Um, but you, I assume her quality of life has improved significantly after the liver transplant. I believe this transplant is probably more for quality of life in a, in a woman who had multiple biliary strictures from the treatment for her, from her NET. Yeah, we've had a few with NET, and surprisingly, the majority have handled the recurrence very well. Yes. Uh, with tumor directed therapy. Yeah, the the the, the tumor free survival is not very good, but we've had very pretty longer term survival, overall survival, even with recurrent NET. I think it made it easier in this case because she had the biliary complications. Maybe a more sort of provocative question would be if she didn't have the biliary complications, would anybody consider her for liver transplantation? And let's say without the, the positive portal lymph nodes, if she just had liver disease only, um, it was unresectable. I'm curious to see what people think about that question. I think we would definitely, I, I agree. I think that's definitely the important point of this case is the biliary mm -hmm. complication. I mean, I think if they didn't, we probably would have tried on Keptam or like other systemic therapies, sort of see how the patient was doing doesn't mean they, they couldn't be a candidate, but we probably would have started with that at least. Um, but obviously in this case, you kind of have the other caveat of she's suffering with PTCs and whatnot. Right. I agree with you, Chris. That's the, you know, that's the comp the easy ones are when they come with liver symptoms. The ones that don't, I don't know how much benefit we're actually giving to them. Yeah. yeah. I think most of us would agree that with the NETs, you have to push their therapy until one of two things happen. Either their liver uh, uh, cell mass is reduced significantly to where they suffer from that, or it's an obstructive uh, biliary uh, cholangitic picture, which many of them actually get into that space. Mm -hmm. One question, one more question, Jason, before we move on, that came up is whether if this patient did have an unknown primary, would you have proceeded with liver transplant? Young patient, uh, extensive disease, no extrahepatic disease, and unknown primary. Would you have proceeded with liver transplant? That's a great question. I think that it really depends on the disease biology, which we can get a crude assessment of based on the histology from a presumed from a liver biopsy of the metastases, and then really just the test of time and how she responds to other adjuvant therapies. And then it's a multi, you know it's a multidisciplinary discussion with the patient and their family and and the team, and maybe it depends on where you're located as far as whether you can get cadaveric organs or if you have access to a living donor program. So I think there's a lot of moving parts. Um, it, it's not an easy yes or no uh, question. And, and the bottom line is these patients recur and their survival is certainly nowhere near the survival of, for example, an HCC patient who's getting a liver transplant. Um, and, and so it makes it difficult to, to, mm -hmm. to justify in a lot of these cases. Great. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Kim, for, for moderating. <clears throat> we'll move on to the next presentation to stay on time. Thank you, everybody, for good questions. The, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Marissa Tabrizian. Or Tabrizian. Uh, she is a liver and hepatitis surgeon at the Reconati Miller Transplant Institute at Mount Sinai, New York. And her presentation today, it's going to be a, a spotlight presentation, liver transplant for ACC following downstaging with PD-1 inhibitors. Parisa, it's all yours. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. You can hear me? Yes. OK, right. thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the AHPB and ASTS and the moderators for inviting me to present today. Um, my talk is on PD-1 inhibitor uh, following downstaging uh, in liver transplantation. I, I broke down the, um, the presentation to three uh, groups. Uh, one, I briefly wanted to talk about the evolution of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors in the treatment of HCC, and then propose why uh, there is a strong role um, early on in the treat treatment paradigm. And then lastly, um, look at its use in the setting of liver transplantation. 
have no disclosures. So we all know this SHARP trial, uh, which essentially showed improved survival and benefit for serafinib. And then as a result, uh, serafinib was considered the standard of care in 2008. Uh, after, a, after this positive trial, there was a decade of negative trials, and this led to the uh, multiple kinase inhibitors that showed survive clinical benefits. And then vatinib was compared head to head to serafinib with a uh, improved outcome of 13.6 uh, uh, months versus 12.3 uh, uh, months and then became a second line competing uh, treatment for advanced HCC uh, along with uh, serafinib. Um, subsequently, uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitors um, uh, have shown encouraging outcomes. So this is uh, essentially the uh, drugs that are listed here, um, anti-CTLA4, um, anti-PD-1, and anti-PD-L1. Um, and then the landscape of the approved drugs over time uh, with an objective response of 15 to 50 years uh, that are listed here. Um, the first trial that was done with nivolumab alone was the Checkmate uh, 040 uh, trial that uh, essentially showed that patients who had complete or partial response to nivolumab had excellent uh, overall survival compared to those who had progressive disease with a median overall survival of 8.9 months. Um, unfortunately, the study did not identify patients uh, who were, did not respond to nivolumab. Um, a follow-up uh, trial was the Kino240 trial um, that uh, compared um, Pembro to uh, placebo uh, as a second line agent in, pa in patients who uh, progressed on serafinib and again showed an objective response of 18.3% versus 4.4%. Uh, in 2017, our, our group looked into who are the responders and, and patients who are resistant to immune checkpoint inhibitors, and they found an immune class of 24% uh, of the cohort that they thought are patients who have all the characteristics that might predict response to uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, last year, they um, did a follow-up study where they looked at immune exclusion class. These are 30% of patients who are shown uh, have shown resistance to uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. And then there's still ongoing uh, work uh, in, in that regard. Um, the new era of HCC management is now the combination uh, uh, of drugs. So either a VEGF plus a checkpoint inhibitor or um, TKI plus checkpoint inhibitors, because we have learned that uh, those the, the tumors that are considered hot tumors have immunogenic tumor environment. Uh, the cold tumors have non, this non-immunogenic tumor environment, and they need this additional drug uh, in order to enhance that environment and achieve the same benefits. So in addition to... Uh, I, Adding VEGF or TKIs have, have, uh, have enhanced this, uh, this outcome. So this brings me to the uh, Imbrave 150 trial uh, that was published last year that essentially showed that the combination of atezolizumab and bevacizumab um, became now the first-line treatment in advanced ACC with an overall survival now of over 17%. Um, so this was a really quick brief summary of the first and second-line agents for, for advanced ACC and how uh, you know, immune therapy uh, now you know, really became first-line treatment. Uh, this takes me to the second part of my talk where I wanted to discuss why we should apply this early on in the treatment paradigm. Um, in the uh, world of transplantation, you know, we continue to show expansion of the Milan criteria. We have pushed our limits and now have transplanted patients that are beyond Milan and have shown that uh, patients who were successfully downstage have uh, competitive long-term outcomes. And also the use of bridge therapies continue to improve um, and reduce the drop out uh, due to tumor progression. Um, as, so there is a more irrational of incorporating immunotherapy early on, and this is a very nice paper by David Pinaro and our team that looked at, was published in Hepatology last year, that looked at it, the pros and cons of um, uh, incorporating immunotherapy early on in the treatment paradigm. I'm just going to uh, touch base on a few of their, uh, of their uh, discussions. Uh, one of them was that, um, one of the rationale was that lower tumor burden, but the, Small tumors that have lower tumor burden may have better response to treatment. There, this has been shown in many uh, histologies. Oh, sorry, this didn't come up. But this has been shown in many histologies where there is an inverse um, uh, um, correlation between tumor burden and, and response to immunotherapy. Uh, the other rationale was that the small tumors um, may actually respond better because they have less heterogeneity or heterozygosity. And this is a, a concept that was looked into by Dr. Villanueva's team by our group last, uh, like few, last year. 
And uh, the uh, patients with early stage or smaller tumors may also have a better immune fitness. So they may be more easily uh, primed to elicit anti-tumor T-cell response. Um, so this has been shown, for example, in melanoma cases where, um, uh, uh, where we have more robust data. Um, we can also argue that there is a um, strong role for new adjuvant versus adjuvant uh, because new adjuvant gives you the opportunity to prime the initial tumor response in the setting of tumor burden. It is also, also easier to assess tumor benefit because we have a pathologic endpoint rather than overall survival. Uh, and also there's a lot of patients who may have a robust response and maybe downstage uh, uh, successfully. So this concept um, brings me to our first experiences with nivolumab uh, in a setting of a resection. So we have used patients who had borderline HCCs and we have uh, given them nivolumab uh, with excellent response and, and, and then um, um, converted these cases to resection cases with uh, great pathologic outcome. Um, and uh, we have used our initial new adjuvant experience was the use of two doses of nilbolumab prior to resection. And then we have undergone um, extensive immunophenotyping. And uh, we just completed our first uh, our trial on a new adjuvant nilbolumab, um, not nilbolumab, sorry, new adjuvant PD-1 inhibitor um, in the setting of resection, uh, which will be uh, uh, discussed at a, at a next uh, um, international meeting. Um, the, uh, since we're incorporating immunotherapy more and more in the treatment of HCC, particularly um, pre-transplantation now, there is like a, the, the safety of local regional therapy plus immunotherapy was, uh, was, was raised. And this is a very nice paper that was published this year that actually showed that the uh, addition to local regional therapy, particularly in these non-inflamed tumors, actually may be of benefit because the local regional therapy may actually alter the tumor environment um, and the systemic therapies may have actually a more effect um, in these in this, um, uh, cold tumor cases. Um, the safety of local regional therapy plus immunotherapy was also discussed in many smaller series. This is one of our papers uh, by our group, um, essentially uh, 29 patients who had 41 local regional therapies um, in addition to immunotherapy, and they had no grade three to five side effects, to, uh, adverse effects during the, their treatment at a median follow-up of 12 months. Um, there are limitations, uh, despite the uh, enthusiasm. Um, I think one of them is it's very difficult to assess treatment response, uh, and this has led to the development of uh, immune resist, um, uh, related resist. Um, it's also not clear who is going to respond and who is not. So I think the, the cause of non-responders and treatment resistance is very complex. And lastly, uh, which is uh, of, of major concern, is that there's a, there's a wide uh, range of immune adverse effects, uh, particularly hepatotoxicity, uh, that we're concerned about. So um, should we now use immunotherapy in a setting of liver transplantation? Um, I think certainly a very controversial topic um, has been discouraged and uh, feared actually due, due to severe rejection and graft loss. Um, there are reports post-transplantation and uh, based on the high rejection and, and graft loss rate of uh, approximately 45% has been strongly discouraged and is really need to be um, uh, you know, discussed case by case. Uh, I, would, I would not say that we should absolutely not do it, but it's really limited to uh, very select cases. This is a nice a systematic review that was looked at, uh, looked at uh, many solid organs who received nivolumab after they, they, um, they uh, recurred with HCC. Um, and they had like 11 uh, uh, liver cases that had a rejection of over 50, 45, 45%. Um, what about um, as bridge to transplantation? So um, this is really based only on a small case series. Um, the, uh, we had extreme uh, variety of, of outcomes. This is uh, a, um, a case that was published two years ago um, by um, the Nashville, Tennessee group. It's a 65-year-old uh, male who um, underwent the salvage transplant, was two years on nivolumab, and um, stopped his last dose eight days prior to transplantation and had a um, fatal hepatic necrosis and passed within 10 days from transplantation. Um, a year later, uh, this group from uh, Europe showed uh, amazing results. Uh, this is a 62-year-old male who had 34 cycles of nivolumab, stopped six weeks prior to transplantation, underwent salvage transplant with excellent outcomes. So this leads me to our experience, uh, which is to date uh, the largest reported, but still small. 
Um, these are uh, cases that were listed from 2017 to 2020. Uh, we transplanted 10 patients who received nivolumab prior to transplantation. Uh, the dose was around 240Q two weeks versus uh, or 480Q uh, four weeks. Um, induction therapy was corticosteroids. Um, and uh, the um, uh, maintenance therapy with, with cell 7 trachomas achieving um, a serum concentration of 10 to 12. Um, the uh, median age was, uh, was 60. The majority were male. Uh, the most common underlying disease was hepatitis B. We had two patients who had uh, co-infected HIV. Uh, MELT score was low, median MELT score of seven. Um, five, half of our cases uh, at diagnosis were outside Milan, but within UCSF, and uh, where we attempted to downstage. Um, the uh, half of our patients were salvage transplants um, who underwent uh, resection at a median interval of, uh, of, of 44 months uh, prior to transplantation. The majority, nine, had local regional therapy, more than two uh, treatments. And uh, this is the most important and, and, and really controversial. Um, uh, nine of our patients had a uh, Nival map for, within four weeks from transplantation, ranging from one to 30. Um, a 30 percent of our patients had over 20 cycles and um, length of stay was uh, I would say appropriate um, overall our complication rate we had a, a case of bi leak which was technical which was repaired on day eight operatively uh, really no significant uh, severe rejection no evidence of recurrence to date um, at a uh, median follow-up of 14 months um, and uh, you know before I conclude, I think uh, I really wanted to, uh, again, acknowledge that this is a small series. This is a heterogeneous nature. This is by no means like a, um, we're not trying to establish any guidelines based on this, but uh, there is some optimism based on these, um, uh, these findings. And I strongly, uh, again, encourage in order to validate these and, and, and look at more safety to really come together and, and uh, try to establish well-controlled clinical uh, trials uh, in order to validate this. And uh, I brought up like a few questions in my conclusion. Uh, first, like we, I showed that the the you know immunotherapy is now first line treatment for BCLCC HCC. We've looked at the it's used in the new adjuvant and adjuvant setting. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there are immune related uh, adverse effects that have we have seen. Um, I do think there's a role, uh, and hopefully uh, we can establish safety of this immunotherapy as bridge therapy, particularly because we are pushing the envelope and we are downstaging more and more patients. I think three questions that come up, I, I do have my personal opinion, and I would love, love to, to discuss this, is one, who should we select? Um, and uh, what should the washout period be, uh, knowing that uh, the um, uh, half-life of, of this drug is like 25 to seven, 27 days? And who will the respond? B or, or those who, who are uh, going to form resistance to the same immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, and certainly, again, I emphasize there has to have to be future uh, well-controlled uh, studies in order to um, validate all of these. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tabrizi. And that was a really wonderful top on a very provocative uh, topic. So before we um, get to a couple questions in the chat room, so I, I'd just like to ask you your own questions about, you know, patient selection uh, to start off with, because some of the patients you showed were, were within the Milan criteria, so you weren't necessarily using um, it as a downstaging approach because they were already within Milan criteria. So I'm trying to figure out, um, you know, what what what's the indication at your center for treating patients with immunotherapy uh, prior? Number one, and um, you know, number two would be, you know, what is there a standard washout period that um, you know that you're um, enforcing or, or looking for before you would consider patients uh, for transplant in an optimal setting, not in the acute setting, obviously, but in a kind of a, a, um, a elective setting. Yep. Uh, I think a uh, great question. I, I, I really want to confirm that uh, we have no data. This is just based on case series. And I'm just, just my personal uh, opinion and also discussing with other centers who have started uh, using immunotherapy as bridge. Um, I do think we should um, uh, just, uh, you know, um, save it to patients who we are downstaging those with a more aggressive tumor biology uh, and certainly not use it in patients who have a, you know, a single tumor within Milan uh, with with, uh, with uh, normal AFP. Um, uh, 
based on our experience, you know, the, the ones that were um, uh, within Milan had either salvage transplants or recurred or had elevated AFP. This is why we have, we used immunotherapy in that setting. Um, but I think just to be safe and, and, and be cautious, um, I do think we should just save it for patients uh, that we are planning to downstage. Um, in terms of washout period, um, I do think we had, uh, you know, good results and 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 our, our patients receive nivolumab within four weeks. I, I don't think this is a safety thing, thing to do, um, you know, in in, in, in future. Um, I, I, I think the my safe answer would be um, a minimum six weeks to eight weeks um, based on uh, the discussion that I had uh, with other centers as well, um, just to have a, a this, this would be my safe answer. Can I, can I just ask a, a follow-up kind of comment on that? So, I mean, you know, the, when we've had these patients in our selection, the kind mm -hmm. of two issues we've discussed is the one you mentioned, WASHA, what should it be, you know, saying that a half-life is 25 days. So we've sort of thrown out two half-lives, which is about what you're saying there. Um, the other issue is, you know, you're especially, if you're talking about people that have been downstaged, do you need a time? And I, I know no one knows this answer, but do you need a time off to make sure this disease isn't going to blow up as soon as you're, you know, transplanted and yeah. whatnot? So those are kind of the two questions we've wrestled with. Since yeah. you guys have one of the larger experiences, are you status set? Like, are you listing patients and status seven in them? Like, what are you, what is your protocol for that? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, certainly we have not done this in our earlier experience, but I, I think moving on, um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, there's still treatment effect on immunotherapy. So I think once you achieved a good response and you feel that, um, you know, you, you uh, the patient received enough uh, systemic therapy, um, I do think that a, a period uh, of uh, prior to transplant uh, off immunotherapy, just to assess if there are any, um, uh, you know, uh, if this blows up on, 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 on future um, uh, pre-transplantation is, 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 uh, is valid. Uh, I, I, th I would say minimum three months. This, my safe answer would be six months. I don't think there's downside once, once you have that good response and we have seen it in our, in our um, uh, advanced uh, cases as well, or those we have treated post-resection, um, the uh, chances of, of, uh, of um, uh, development of new diseases is, is, is low. Uh, so I think if you if they do recur uh, off treatment, you actually selected them well, and 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 they not they would they would do uh, they would not do well post transplantation. So um, six to three to six months would be my uh, my safe answer. Um, that's what we're going by now. So we do make them status seven prior to uh, transplantation. Yeah, I would I would like to add that emphasize that period of stability, particularly if you're doing a living donor, you have that ability to schedule it when you're going to do it. It also yeah. makes you feel better about using the donor. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly easier to do with living donors than diseased. But yeah, I think it's a very, very good point. And uh, I, I think we just have to put our experience together and, and, and have, a, have a clear consensus guidelines uh, so that everybody does the same thing so we can have uh, robust data. And then uh, there's a couple of questions about any issues with hyper progressors, you know, people who started on therapy, but, um, you know, have significant progression. And then someone else is asking about treatment for in the setting of HCV. Yeah. Uh, so we have, uh, we, we st I, I don't know the, the dropouts rates uh, exactly, but we do have patients listed uh, that we are, are intending to transplant that have dropped out because of progression. Um, those are patients that, um, you know, did not respond well to uh, a few, are already few cycles of nivolumab. So I, uh, we, we do have those. I, I don't have the exact data right now, but um, those are patients that we obviously um, uh, don't select uh, and, and, and delist. Um, in terms of uh, hepatitis C treatment, so uh, you know the majority of our cases was were Hep B, but uh, we um, uh, tend not to treat uh, Hep C um, because because of just uh, organ shortages and trying to give them hepatitis uh, C donors and then treat them after. So um, we don't. I don't have a particular answer for that. Then there's a couple questions about local regional therapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, should one um, kind of empirically initiate com combination immunotherapy uh, with local regional therapy, only do it after traditional local regional therapy has failed? And then there's a question about immunotherapy combined with tear versus a TACE, if you mm -hmm. can comment 
Yeah, um, I think the, 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 the one of the papers that I published that I showed from Dr. Lovett essentially looked at this concept of local regional plus immunotherapy and, and the, the ones that were called tumors that were resistant to immunotherapy, actually the use of local regional therapy enhances their, their effect. Um, I don't think we should just uh, start with local regional therapy plus immunotherapy directly. Um, our approach is to start with local regional therapy and then if they, they have small progression then add immunotherapy to, to, to the treatment. Um, and uh, Terra versus TACE, um, uh, we are, the majority of our cases were TACE, but we are um, a, a large center that uh, is using TER. Um, I, I think our outcomes were excellent uh, during, the, um, uh, during the bridge therapy, but I, I don't think we have enough data to, uh, to comment on that. Great. Thank you. So um, again, wonderful talk. I think in the thank interest you. of time, we'll have to move on, but uh, really wonderful, Perissa. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we're going to go back to uh, Dr. Uh, Hawksworth, again, who's going to present um, uh, another case on the management of a gallbladder cancer, I think incidentally found in the workup of a patient for uh, transplantation. And we have as our feature panelist, Dr. Sky uh, Mayo um, from Oregon. Uh, Jason? So thanks again um, for the opportunity and for Dr. Mayo to agree to, to do this. This is an interesting and difficult case and I'm, I'm curious to see what everyone thinks about this. So our patient is a 51 year old male with a newly diagnosed autoimmune cirrhosis picked up on just workup for elevated liver function tests. He, he was thought to have an overlap autoimmune hepatitis PSC um, condition and during the workup on imaging was found to have a 1.5 centimeter gallbladder polyp. Um, he's had no prior liver decompensations. He was really asymptomatic before all of this. No other past medical surgical history. He's very fit um, male working full time and, and was really surprised at all of this. So you can see his labs here, um, his, his kidney function is normal. His albumin was a little bit low at 3.2. His total bilirubin was three, um, and he had a little bit of a transaminitis. His INR was 1.1. His platelets were low at 69. Um, he, was, he was basically called a child class B with all of this, despite his lack of symptoms. And his MELD sodium score was 13. His, his CA99 was 53. Um, so this is his initial MRI, and you'll be able to see he's very cirrhotic. He has a large portal vein consistent with portal hypertension with varices. He has a very large spleen. Um, and you'll see he has actually two gallbladder polyps. One is 1.5 centimeter, and they're both on the peritoneal side of the gallbladder. Again, his spleen is very large, extending almost down into his pelvis and he has a recanalized umbilical vein. So cirrhosis with portal hypertension, two gallbladder polyps, one is 1.5 centimeters, and they both appear to be on the peritoneal surface of the uh, gallbladder. So we went right to cholecystectomy, and this is just a short video of what that looked like. You can see his liver is very cirrhotic. There's a recanalized umbilical vein. Um, he had varices around his gallbladder. Aside from that, it was relatively straightforward. There was no spillage of um, bile during the case. And we did a liver biopsy at the same time, just because his, di his diagnosis of his cirrhosis was not entirely clear. His gallbladder pathology came back for adenocarcinoma, biliary type ar arising within severe dysplasia and intestinal metaplasia. His cystic duct margin was negative. There was one lymph node that came out with the gallbladder that was negative for carcinoma. So he was considered a T2A because it was on the peritoneal side, um, N0. And then his liver biopsy showed some hepatitis and cirrhosis. So we did a metastatic workup, which was negative. He had a PAN scan, a PET scan, all were negative. His CA99 post-op was 70. Again, it was 53 pre-op. And we ended up tipsing him knowing that he was going to need another surgery. And th so this is his metastatic sort of staging scan. His chest CT was negative. You can see there is some ascites around his liver. His liver is cirrhotic. Again, there's um, portal hypertension with varices, and his tips 
looked like it was in a reasonable position. So to sum this up, 51 year old, a very fit male with child class B cirrhosis, thought to be autoimmune and, and, and or PSC, had a T2A gallbladder adenocarcinoma with a negative metastatic workup. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Mayo and just ask what you think about this case and what would be your next step in his treatment? Dr. Hawksworth, as you promised, this is a uh, interesting and I'm sure going to be a controversial case as we discuss it a bit further. Um, so I, I think as we kind of look at this with a, a T2A gallbladder cancer um, and with the one negative lymph node that you have, he does have a fairly low risk of disease. Uh, the standard of care recommended for this would be a, you know, a uh, resection, uh, assuming that he has, a, you know, a risk of residual disease in his gallbladder fossa, as well as a portal lymph adenectomy. Um, I take it with the tips and you're hinting towards another operation that uh, um, uh, it's going to be one of those, and I doubt that it's probably going to be a central liver resection. Um, so I, I agree. I'm happy to see that you got a PET knowing that you know we can find uh, radiographically occult disease in upwards of 50 to 60 percent of patients so i think that's an important thing um i think at our institution we would also look to see um uh if there is any next generation sequencing that have been done knowing that patients with gallbladder cancer do harbor you know uh quite an array of uh, uh targetable mutations so um i'm interested to see what you're you're looking at doing next yeah, so really that's the question is, what surgery does he need next? And, and what is the sequence? And is there any consideration for new adjuvant chemotherapy, which we'll talk about a little bit later? Um, and as far as the sequencing, that that's sort of in hold by the oncologist for potential uh, future therapy. And I'll, I'll let you talk about that a little bit later. So our first question was, is, is this patient going to tolerate a radical cholecystectomy with uh, cirrhosis, portal, significant portal hypertension, even with the tips in, you could see he had small ascites. Um, so, and without a transplant option, if he decompensates hard, is that the right thing to do? And is that really going to help him with the peritoneal side, gallbladder, adenocarcinoma? Or do we really just need to stage him with a lymphadenectomy? And there is some retrospective data looking at this question. Um, this is a study published in 2015, where they, again, looked retrospectively at gallbladder cancers, either on the peritoneal side or the liver side of the, um, uh, or gallbladder cancers on the peritoneal or liver side, and looked at the outcomes of these patients. So there were some interesting findings in this study, um, and this has been replicated. But one is that a gallbladder cancer on the hepatic side has a much worse prognosis than a gallbladder cancer on the peritoneal side. If you look just at the peritoneal side gallbladder cancers, the ones that got a hepatic resection versus the ones that didn't get a hepatic resection, there's really no difference in the survival. And the survival is actually very good over a long period of time. And then when you look at just the gallbladder cancers that were on the hepatic side, um, those patients did worse as mentioned, but they did benefit from um, liver resection with an improved survival. So based on this data and really just the, the sense that he would not do well with the liver resection given the severity of his liver disease and portal hypertension, we just did a portal lymphadenectomy and this is a, a short video of what that looked like in the end. Um, you can see his bile duct is skeletonized. The, he had a right hepatic, um, a replaced right hepatic artery. The portal vein is there and the, and the main hepatic uh, artery is skeletonized. So got a nice sample of lymph nodes, 16, the pathologist was nice to us. All of those were negative for any um, metastases. So we have a patient with a T2A gallbladder cancer, um, no lymph nodes that are positive. We didn't feel like a radical cholecystectomy with the liver resection was safe in this patient given the severity of his liver disease. So back to you, Dr. Mayo, what do you think about all of that and what would you do next with this patient? Well, I, I think the kids at this point really highlights uh, something you know, that's changed and has been incorporated into the eighth edition of the AJCC manual, which was a T2A and B distinction. 
which in a lot of the large case series, including uh, Dr. Pollock's, uh, you know, it was in like 2006, there was no distinction in T2 disease for the A and B, the peritoneal versus hepatic side. And now it's pretty clear, like when we look at those, and it's why the recurrence, I think, residual disease in the liver bed versus in the nodal region varied widely between kind of 10 and 40%. We know that as you get higher in T stage, you do have an increased risk of residual disease, but really it's your regional disease and the distant disease found upon re-exploration that drives survival. Um, I, I, one question I have for you is 16 lymph nodes. So in total now you have 17 lymph nodes negative for disease. You have a PET scan. Um, how do you get your pathologist to count that many lymph nodes? That's fantastic. Well, as I said, they were very nice to us. I don't know if we truly had that many lymph nodes, but um, adequate sample for sure. So, um, you know, I, I think that the current recommendation for gallbladder cancer, you know, for this patient, ignoring that he has the, the PSC autoimmune hepatitis and portal hypertension, et cetera, would be, you know, uh, uh, the bill cap trial um, for uh, adjuvant cape cytobine um, for this patient. Um, the challenge with that trial is, of course, you know, uh, it was only... 18% um, of the patients and it had gallbladder cancer. So it wasn't really powered to actually find a benefit. And they actually had to do a, a, uh, um, a, 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 a pre-specified analysis to actually see the overall survival benefit in this mixed bag of biliary tract cancers that were randomized to adjuvant capecitabine versus observation. So I think, you know, uh, if we were ignoring everything else, like I think, you know, at this point, like he still has a risk of disease we know that patients with resective gallbladder cancer, you know, Memorial, Hopkins, other places have published that the median time to recurrence is, you know, 11 months for these people, even with no negative disease. We also have data showing that for people that have T2A N0 with no residual disease found on exploration, that their median disease-free survival is, you know, upwards of, you know, five years. Um, so it, it's, a, it, it, it's a challenging thing to consider. So I think uh, the patient's been completely staged. They've had a more than thorough lymphadenectomy, which was their high risk for, per, for dis residual disease. They can't tolerate a central liver resection, but with the potential for a transplant, that may be the ultimate you know, liver resection for them to go through. Um, they still do have a risk uh, of recurrence. Yeah, so as you mentioned, bill cap is really sort of the standard of care for these patients. Um, and just briefly, um, like you mentioned, this was a large randomized uh, multi-center phase three study. And while the intention to treat analysis didn't reach statistical uh, significance, they did do a per protocol analysis, which reached statistical significance, favoring capsidabine for adjuvant therapy. And so that's exactly what this patient is getting is six months of cap capsidabine. Um, and, you know, the, the Bill Cap trial was, was a positive study in, in their sort of secondary an analysis, um, but there's really just not great medical therapy for, for these kind of patients. So I was gonna have Dr. Mayo talk about this new study looking at neoadjuvant therapy for, for these types of patients. Yeah, thank you. It looks like Dr. Pollock just chimed in about this uh, raising awareness. So this is, is a, a trial brought through the uh, um, NCTN uh, with Shisher Mattel from Emory as the uh, PI. Um, and it really uh, is looking to look at the risk we have for patients that have a, a resection um, for T2 or T3 gallbladder cancers um, without any other evidence of disease. And it's a two to one randomization to surgery up front that has to be within, uh, um, within uh, 12 weeks of the incidentally discovered gallbladder cancer um, to, um, uh, uh, to randomize to uh, um, uh, three months of gem cyst based upon the ABCO2 data, which a lot of pa people actually, you know, or fit patients will extrapolate beyond um, the fact that that was a trial for patients with advanced disease. Um, and uh, for fit patients, we'll sometimes recommend gem cysts over uh, cape cytobine. So two to one randomization, um, they'll then have another staging laparoscopy uh, uh, resection. Um, the outcome is, uh, is overall survival. 
Um, so you know, this study was just activated. It's being opened at OHSU, Emory, along with several other centers as well. So I think it will, um, it will take a lot of uh, efforts to accrue uh, across multiple sites um, to, uh, to get these patients in to answer an important question, importantly to see if we take patients in the operating room for a central delivery section, re-resection, lymphadenectomy, et cetera, put them through that risk, um, are we actually going to achieve a benefit with, a, with neoadjuvant treatment? Um, so uh, I, I think it's a really important trial and I encourage everyone to support it. And then this is basically my last slide, but this is a relatively young, physio, you know, physiologically young patient, very fit, who is sort of mildly decompensated with um, autoimmune uh, uh, PSC subtype cirrhosis, and ultimately is almost certainly going to need a transplant. So I'm going to open this up to the panel and just kind of get everyone's opinion on how long you would wait in a patient like this before transplanting them. And then he is actively looking for a living donor. And is that appropriate? And how long would you wait in that setting? Um, and let's say he decompensates on chemotherapy. I'm just curious what other people think in this case. Thank you, Jason. And thank you, Scott, for a nice presentation and discussion. Um, I think the first question we'd love to open it certainly is the patient transplant candidate and how long would you wait? I think many of us would agree that uh, uh, you would wait a little bit longer for an observation period to see how the patient does after his resection, uh, given the risk of recurrence, and very much like you wait for HTC for recurrence. Now, certainly there's a double-edged sword. You may have waited long enough for him to recur and be no longer transplantable, uh, but the literature in cholangiocarcinomas carcinomas as well as adenocarcinomas is not as favorable as a presaurus carcinoma. I would love to hear what other people would uh, do in that context, whether they would consider liver transplant, should the person be either at this stage now or more decompensated? Would love to hear from the panel. I probably wouldn't transplant right away. I, you know, it seems like the liver function is relatively stable. Um, I would wanna give it time to make sure that there isn't um, rapidly recurrent disease. Uh, we've been burned by this before. Uh, where I we've had gallbladder cancer and it's come back immediately post-transplant. Sure, Roberto? Um, I, I was gonna ask uh, Kim, I, I, I agree with you that, uh, and I, uh, I will also wait, I wouldn't offer transplantation immediately. But the question is totally arbitrary, how much time would you wait? Mm -hmm. Right, so I don't think we have any evidence of, of that. Would you wait six months? Would you wait one year? Uh, seems that perhaps nobody will think about waiting to a short period of time of three months or something like that. But is there anything that uh, we can come with a kind of a recommendation? I, I wouldn't. I, I will go for six months to one year at least. Uh, Chris, Parisa. Yeah, I mean. I I think uh, I get the idea of everyone wanting to. I think at our center, you know, you'd probably be realistically minimum two years before we'd even contemplate it. And I mean, mm -hmm. I, I know that's that's tough, but yeah, I, I don't, uh, I'm not <laughs> saying, you know, someone couldn't push the envelope and do less, but I think mm -hmm. we've been burned too. So maybe um, diverse opinions, Parissa. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I would certainly not jump into transplant right now. Um, I think if you wanted to transplant, living donor is appropriate. Uh, the timing is of question. Um, uh, six months is a little bit too early for me. I think at least a year. Um, yeah, there's always this, uh, you know, it's always, it's this, it's this challenge because what if the patient like decompensates, but um, uh, minimum a year. But if, if we do plan, I think living donor is appropriate. Yeah. Now, at our center, uh, having encountered this previously a couple of times, we have done uh, adjuvant chemotherapy with radiation therapy and did not move to lymphadenectomy if that uh, central lymph node was negative. And that seems to be a favorite approach. And the outcomes have been typically either patients have dragged along with their cirrhosis and one patient decompensated, but he was not a transplant candidate for other indications, other reasons. Uh, other thoughts from the group? 
Uh, Jason, uh, what do you estimate this uh, patient's five-year survival um, with his current uh, portal hypertension and what sounds like progressing, you know, PSC and autoimmune hepatitis? Yeah, it's hard to know for sure. I think that one one factor that hadn't really been sorted out yet was um, does he have active autoimmune hepatitis? It, it was hard to sort of subtype him. Um, I mentioned he had kind of an overlap syndrome, but it wasn't real clear based on his um, serologies. So, you know, the thought was when he completes his six months of chemotherapy to maybe even trial um, some steroids and see if he responds and if that can slow down the progression of his liver failure. Outside of that, I, I, you know, I, I think that he's got maybe a couple of years before he starts to really suffer from um, his liver failure, given the kind of mild jaundice, mild ascites, a little bit of encephalopathy, um, all medically controlled, but not looking good long-term. Um, I think, Jason, he um, he tolerated the, the gallbladder and the lymphadenectomy pretty well, right? So that kind of gives you an idea of how much reserve uh, he has. And I think he'll be able to hold on to this liver for a while while you wait and see. Yeah, I agree with everyone else. I think really, you know, uh, he has a risk of, you know, intra of, you know, recurrent disease, re regardless if he was node negative, et cetera, gallbladder cancer, just being a bad actor. He has time, give him time. You're using that time to do uh, adjuvant uh, cape cytobine. Uh, I see in the chat, there's also some questions about, you know, the applicability of SWOG 0809, which was uh, um, gem cape um, and, uh, and uh, chemo radiation for patients with node positive um, R1 resection or T2, T3 gallbladder cancers and extrahepatic phalangios. Um, so there are other things to consider um, that of course could like possibly impact uh, you know, future transplant considerations, but. So Sky, what would be the five-year survival for this patient if he does not undergo a central liver resection after having had lymphadenectomy, should he not have cirrhosis without well, a central resection? Yeah, so I mean, I would estimate his five-year survival at much greater than 50%. I looked, uh, I've been kind of looking at this to see through various series for people that are now, that we have the distinction of T2A and T2B, which I think is very important in this, that are T2A, N0, without any evidence of residual disease, since it's on the peritoneal side, he had an extensive lymphadenectomy. I think we can pretty much call this that he doesn't have residual disease has yes. less than a 10% chance, even with T2 of residual disease in the gallbladder fossa, if we were to resect that. So um, I would put him at much higher than 50%. Um, so that's I, the I would defer to the group. Yeah. So that's the clincher, I think. That, yeah. that five-year survival in the context of T2A, we almost want to consider him after adjuvant chemotherapy for his, what his liver disease is doing, what stage of liver disease he is, and certainly like Kim had said, he's got time to wait on and, and be looked at. And certainly the cancer is not gonna be the concern in the first year, maybe two, uh, given what he has with the 2-2-A on the peritoneal surface. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I would. Um, I would uh, also like encourage, you know, in a next generation sequencing of his cancer, you know, up to 30% of these patients will harbor an ERBB2 or HER2 amplification. So there are other chemotherapeutics he could have that may not have the impact that cytotoxic chemotherapy has. Yeah, thank you, Sky. Well, I wanna thank the presenters. Yet this case shows another scenario where HPB surgeons cross with the transplant surgeons into a transplant oncology space. And uh, the presenters, I wanna thank you. The moderators, I wanna thank you. Uh, phenomenal quality for your presentations, clear collaboration, which we admire and, and cherish. And I want to pass on the uh, mic to Dr. Pollock to close the session for this evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marwan. I similarly want to thank uh, you, and I want to thank our colleagues at the ASTS for this wonderful uh, collaborative uh, webinar tonight. Um, we had wonderful speakers and panelists, so I want to thank all of them. And then I want to thank um, all of the members of the AHPBA and the ASTS um, who joined us tonight. And for any of you who are non-members, uh, please think of joining our respective um, associations. Um, and I just would like to uh, remind uh, folks of our um, meeting um, in uh, August of this year, August 2nd through uh, uh, 5th. We are hoping to have an in-person meeting 
um, in Miami for the AHPBA. While we are planning for all contingencies, um, we do hope that we will be able to have um, an in-person um, meeting. Uh, we had a very good response with over 400 abstracts submitted this year. And uh, we committed to having absolutely zero mantles. And I'm proud to um, uh, state that we've accomplished that and we will have a, the most diverse uh, program that our association has ever had this year in Miami. So with that, um, once again, I'd like to uh, thank um, all of you for participating tonight. Uh, we wish you well, stay safe. We will see you soon. Have a good night.